This episode brought to you by Tomes, which is a natural sleep and sound healing portal helping people globally to get to sleep faster and stay asleep longer through Tomes.com. That's www.tauhomms.com. It's My Right Stuff with your host, Grammy Award winning record producer and inventor, Toby Wright. My Right Stuff is brought to you by Tones, a natural sleep and sound healing portal available globally at www.tones.com. That's www.taumnhoms.com. And I'm your announcer, Grinnin Barrett. Here's Toby. Hey, hey, I'm Lord Toby Wright, and this is My Right Stuff News. Well, in music news, Coldplay released their ninth studio album, Music of the Spheres. The 12-track LP produced by pop hitmaker Max Martin will be out today, October 15th. Johnny Marr releases Fever Dreams, parts one through four today. This will be Mars's fourth solo release. And the former Smiths guitarist released 2013's The Messenger, 2014's Playland, and my favorite, 2018's Call the Comet. I like that one. And multi-Grammy award-winning Rock and Roll Hall of Fame guitarist Carlos Santana is back in the news. He releases his star-studded, masterful new album, Blessings and Miracles, today. Get this one. The new record sees Santana collaborating with a diverse host of brilliant artists, writers, and producers, including Rob Thomas, Chris Stapleton, g Easy, Diane Warren, Steve Winwood, Chick Corea, Rick Rubin, Corey Glover, Kirk Hammett, Allie Brook, American Authors, and Narada Michael Walden, among others, on this genre-bending, hook-filled, knockout musical celebration. That sounds like a fantastic record. On the heels of his career-spanning memoir, Unrequited Infatuations, actor and musician Stephen Van Zandt is launching Little Stephen's Underground Apothecary. It's his own line of cannabis products. And 10% of the profits from Little Stephen's Underground Apothecary sales will be put toward the National Organization for Marijuana Legalization. Can't wait for that because I'm all for it. That's right. Well, Paul McCartney claims John Lennon instigated the Beatles' breakup well, in a new interview, McCartney discusses the breakup of the Beatles and says John Lennon instigated the band's split in an upcoming interview with the BBC Radio 4. Let's all check that one out, because I don't know. In film and TV news, Halloween Kills comes out today. It's directed by David Gordon Green and written by Green, Danny McBride, and Scott Teams. And the film is a sequel to 2018's Halloween and the, the 12th installment in the Halloween franchise. The film stars Jamie Lee Curtis and Nick Castle, who reprise their roles as Laurie Strode and Michael Myers. It will satisfy those in need of a slasher film with lots of blood and guts. <laughs> you know I like those, right? <laughs> And The Last Duel is a historical drama directed and produced by Ridley Scott. It's based on the book of the same name. And the film stars Matt Damon, Adam Driver, Jodie Comer, and Ben Affleck. And the film will be in theaters today, October 15th. So let's go see it. Take a date. Well, You. Season 3 comes out today on Netflix. It's a psychological thriller about Joe Goldberg a New York bookstore manager and serial killer. The episodes are fucking bonkers, and the performances are insanely good. Well, that's what showrunner Sarah Gamble tweeted last week. And the Korean horror thriller sci-fi series Squid Game continues its reign as the most watched and the most discussed show around the world. The Netflix series 
centers on a contest where 456 players, drawn from different walks of life, but each deeply in debt, play a set of children's games with deadly penalties for losing. All for the chance to win a 45.6 billion won prize. It's a crazy little show. And in the world of sports, this past weekend, Tyson Fury and Dante Wilder met for the third time. Fury Wilder 3, it did not disappoint. Fury defeated Wilder by knockout to retain his WBC heavyweight title. It was a thrilling fight and one that many are calling the fight of the year. Well, hockey's back and the NHL is ready for an 82 game season and wide open race for the Stanley Cup. The new season starts this week with most arenas at full capacity again. That's fantastic to hear. And in the world of gear, this one is really special. A Swiss guitar builder named Relish. They're making innovative and impressive sounding instruments. Relish Guitars offers a very unique playability and an unparalleled tone range. Incredible sustain, a wealth of clarity and tone, and a well-balanced humbucker duo provide an excellent base for expeditions into the depths of tone. Swap your pickups with P90s or blend in the acoustic air of the piezo to enter a whole different sound spectrum within just seconds. Relish's patented pickup swapping system makes changing pickups a breeze. Regular pickups mounted onto the frames offer you the largest range of tones. Just pull out a pickup and drop in another. Well, it's that simple. And I'm sure that you can find them by going to this URL. And that's the news today for October 15th. Now over to you, Toby. Well, thank you, Toby. Hey, hey, and welcome back to My Right Stuff, which is a film, TV, sports, music, adventure, and inspirational lifestyle podcast. I'm your host, Lord Toby Wright, and my co-host today is Mr. Gareth Dighton, a.k.a. DJ Chunky from Chunky's Choice Cuts, all the way from Wales. Hey, Gareth, what's happening today? Hey, Toby, my friend. As usual, I'm super excited and looking forward to this incredible episode. This is going to be one incredible episode, I can tell you. I and so, as you yeah. know, Gareth, yeah, I know, right? So today we have a very special guest. His name is Matt Stutzman, and I think he certainly hits the bullseye. He's a oh. silver medalist, para-Olympian <clears throat> in archery, and he also holds the world record for the longest, most accurate shot in the sport. That's wow. crazy. That's, yeah, awesome. Right? But, but first, Gareth, I want to thank all of our supporters who stream, download, watch, and support My Right Stuff. Keep spreading the word, my friends. I really do appreciate it. And be sure to click on our show notes below and follow our link tree for a full list of all the channels we're streaming on, as well as all our sites and social media platforms. If you would like to donate to My Right Stuff, please do. But please follow our support link. Every single dollar helps support My Right Stuff crew who make all of this possible. And of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel as well as the podcast channel of your choice, so you never miss a single episode. Please head on over to MyRightStuff.com and go to the store tab. Pick up some snazzy merch for those bodies. Well, Gareth, as I've said, today's guest is Mr. Matt Stutzman. Besides holding the world record for the longest accurate shot, he has also represented the USA at three consecutive Paralympic Games. Let's have a warm welcome for Mr. Matt Stutzman. Hey, Matt, how's it going today? Hello, guys. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, man. How are you doing so today? Oh, I'm feeling good. It's a perfect day out. Perfect. I love Always that. Helps. So, hey, Matt, I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you for being on My Right Stuff. Also, let you know what a huge inspiration you are to all of us here. And also, I'm, I'm sure many, many people around the world. So, here at My Light... Here at My Right Stuff, I'd like to start basically at the beginning. Um, and do you mind uh, talking to us about your birth defect? Yeah. So uh, when I was born, I was born without any arms, kind of uh, like you see me right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. The doctors couldn't explain why I was born this way. There was no medical reason for it. Um, I think the statistic when I was born might have been one in a million uh 
people are born without a leg, a toe, or some sort of missing parts. And for me, I just happen to be born without any arms. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and you were adopted at a young age. What can you tell us about your family? Yeah. So when I was born, my birth parents asked the doctors how, what to do because I was a rare rarity. Mm-hmm. Right. And the doctor said that it was going to cost millions of dollars to raise me. And I was literally going to need someone to help me do everything in my entire life. Okay. They didn't have the millions of dollars. So at three months old, um, they put me up for adoption and were hoping a family with money um, would adopt me. And I was in an orphanage till about 13 months old. Mm hmm. And in walked this amazing family. Uh, I, by the way, I have eight brothers and sisters, and they decided that they were going to adopt me. And no, they don't have millions of dollars. But I guess when they walked into the orphanage, I saw them and I jumped up and tried to get to them. And, and they just knew that I had chosen them, I guess. And yeah. that's when I kind of like to say where my life really started. Wow. Wow. So um, incredible. you just said you've got eight brothers and sisters. Are you actually a close family? We're a pretty close family. Um, I talk to my mom and dad pretty much at least every other day. Mm -hmm. Um, And most of my family lives in Iowa. Um, I'm actually pretty close to my oldest brother. Yeah. Um, We have a a lot of similarities um, between him and I. Except he has arms. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, can you tell us about the challenges you faced growing up with schooling? and, And were your friends and family supportive? So I got a little bit lucky. Um, my dad happened to be the principal of the school I went to for most of my most of my school years. Right. Okay. That being said, there were still challenges. Like uh, people would still pick on me and make fun of me because I had no arms. Right. Um, and I still had to figure out how I was going to do stuff. Um, the benefit that I had from that is that my dad was kind of there to kind of keep people in check. Right. Uh, and kind of you know, keep people from it going kind of out of control because, you know, he was the principal. Um, I remember trying to figure out how I was going to write and how I was going to do all that kind of stuff. But uh, I like I remember I had to use a bar stool (laughs) at school so I could sit up high enough so I could put my feet on the table so I could write. So (laughs) ironically, ironically, at like, eight years old, I was already on a bar stool. <laughs> <laughs> Getting started early. Yeah. <laughs> Hasn't changed since. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. Hi, Matt. So I was reading through some bits about you and I read that your family were hunters. Um, is that actually where you first experienced archery? Yeah, I remember my brother and my dad would Get, they had a bows and, and they would go hunting. And I remember watching them and I actually tried it once when I was younger, I'd hold the bow in my left foot and try to pull it back with my right foot and yeah. it never worked out. So, but I always remember seeing them do that. And so when I let's see what about 10 years ago, when I was sitting at the, at home on a couch, trying to figure out how I was going to put food on the table, that memory came back in. I saw a guy on TV and and then, but then I remembered my brother going out in the woods with a bow and I was like, you know what? Now's the time to try it. It's been, you know, 15 years and the technology is better. Maybe I wasn't looking at it at the right angle and and maybe I can make it work this time. Mm -hmm. That's pretty awesome. That's very awesome. And, uh, you got into it obviously because, uh, you know, of your brothers and stuff, right? Yeah, my, my brother and so my so- brother and my dad. Yeah. You know, just because when I was younger, even though I couldn't shoot a bow, I still loved marksmanship. In fact, uh, I would brag that I was the best mark- marksman um, in the family. So when I was younger, about the time my brother was shooting bows and stuff, I would put a penny out at 50 yards and was able to hit it with a twenty two. And, uh, I remember going inside and I'll give them these, you know, I'd have three or four pennies have holes in them. I'd give them to my mom and, and dad and be like, here you go. You know? And, and I just thought that anybody with a gun could do that. I didn't realize that it was a talent I had, you know, obviously until later on in my life. 
Right. Okay. That's pretty awesome. That's very awesome. Mm -hmm. So what was, how supportive were your family in helping you achieve these goals, like with equipment and training and stuff? You know, my mom and dad are amazing because at a very young age, they taught me for one to never give up, right? Like life's going to get tough. Right. And especially for me, because I had no arms and a lot of times I would get judged based on what I look like, not what I was capable of doing. And so right. they knew that I was going to face that. So they taught me how to adapt to the world instead of mm -hmm. the world adapting to me. And that was a mindset right. thing that they taught me. So when I yeah. told them I was going to do archery, it was like, yeah, we know you can do it. You know, like they were, you know, all my life I tried. Like I remember uh, at 12, I told my dad I was going to be the next Michael Jordan. Yeah. And uh, he went and got me a basketball hoop and basketball. And taught awesome. me to, and told me to go practice, you know? So like in their minds, they might've known I would never be Michael Jordan, but they weren't afraid yeah. to be like, here, here's the stuff to, to prove, you know, go for it. And so when I told them archery, they were like, you know, Hey, you know, we believe in you. We, you know, you got this. That's fantastic. So I imagine you've had to have some kind of specialist equipment. So how exactly is actually your bow customized? You ready? Are you guys sitting down? Yeah. <laughs> zero, yes. zero, brace, brace zero modifications. Here. What? Zero. Zero. Really? Zero. Wow. I, all the all the equipment that I use is something yeah. I can just buy right off the shelf. Wow. Wow. Yep. I pride myself yeah. in being able to take any bow from any manufacturer and shoot it without wow, any modifications for to me what's for for it for me or whatever whatsoever yeah wow wow okay so my next question matt is um when exactly did you consider doing this for a living it would have been uh october 2010 and that's when i decided that uh i was going to get a bow and teach myself how to shoot it to put food on the table I remember Googling how to teach an armless man how to shoot a bow. <laughs> in, listen, in 2010, you ain't, you're not finding anything about how to teach an armless man how to shoot a bow. Uh, so I had to self self teach myself how to do that. Um, and then yeah, I can remember this day clearly. It was January 12th, 2011. That's when I just got back from, um, I had a tournament, my very first tournament ever. And, and that's, that's when I went to it. And I remember immediately falling in love with it. And immediately that's when I realized like I had found my Michael Jordan moment. I had found what I was supposed to be doing with my life. And yeah, there was no breaks after that. It was like a hundred percent throttle figuring it out and and 100 percent immersed into trying to become the best in the world that's fantastic that's so crazy. obviously your inspiration to do this was driven by a need to do this for your family and put food on the mm -hmm. table right but did you join a club or something or how, how did how did you get you know just going down the road to being the best in the world yeah i uh i didn't join any club that's a hundred percent me in my backyard. In fact, the town that I lived in had a no archery ordinance. You weren't allowed to shoot in your front yard or shoot bows in town. And there I was in my ha at my house in the front yard with the target against the neighbor's house. And I was, <laughs> I was shooting arrows <laughs> like eight hours a day toward this guy's house. And I thought I was going to get in trouble because a cop came by one day and he was just intrigued on how an armless man was shooting and pretty soon, like, it wouldn't be any surprise if, you know, like once once or twice a day, uh, I would have, you know, 20, 30 people drive by just to watch me shoot. Uh, yeah, I can I can imagine that to be true. Yeah, I can absolutely. Imagine I can imagine that being being a bit of a spectacle. So um, um, once you actually started competing, like sort of professionally, did you actually find the sport welcoming? 
at the very beginning, um, it was welcoming. It was, uh, who's the new guy without arms? Um, you know, it started off kind of like, there's no way an armless man can shoot a bow. And then, then it was like, whoa, he's doing it. And then it was like, he probably won't be any good or whatever. But then it started getting good. So it took some years. So yeah. for the first like four or five years, uh, everybody was like open, yeah. open armed, welcoming me in. Then I started winning. <laughs> And then, and then <laughs> right. it changed a little bit. The, they were still happy I was there, but yeah. they weren't as happy as they were when I started. <laughs> right, because you're beating them, yeah. right? So, yeah, I can imagine them being a little jealous, a little bit, you know, whatever that emotion mm -hmm. is that, yeah. that, that, that competitors have when they, they see their competition kicking mm -hmm. ass. So, so, you know, so they have to step for, up their for trials to go to the games in 2012. When I came in, the trials were in 2012, but I didn't know about it. And yeah. uh, when I, I found out about it in like the end of 2011. So all the slots had already been earned by Team USA. And they were just fighting for the yeah. spots to go to the games. There's only two people that got to go. And I went into trials and won all of trials and I was the new guy. So the people who had spent four years on Team USA in the past, who went to all these tournaments all over the world yeah. and earned those slots, didn't even get to go because I rolled in and won the trials. <laughs> <laughs> well, That's awesome. Right. So Matt, did you always see yourself becoming an Olympic athlete or did that just happen? When I started archery, it was... Um, obviously to figure out how to put food on the table. And then when I started to go to tournaments, it was the desire was for me just to be the best in the world. And I wanted to win every tournament I want, went to, there was money on the line. So I was like, I want to win the money. Yeah. Um, at no point, ironically, at no point from 2010 till November of 2011, no, uh, I take that back. It would have been uh, January of 2012. That's when okay. uh, a coach from Team USA reached out to me, and they're like, "Hey, I've, I've been seeing you doing pretty good at some tournaments. You should try out for the for the games." And I'm like, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> and then, and then he said, "You, you want to go to London?" And I'm like, "I guess so." Like, do I? I didn't. I was so new to it. I didn't know what it, what he was talking about. And then he informed me. Okay. And I'm like, you know, I'll give it a try. Like I, I didn't expect, I didn't expect to be an Olympian or even a three-time Olympian or even win any medals at the games because I didn't even know what it was until six months before trials. And that's just because in my mind, I just wanted to win what I was after. It wasn't on a world stage. My mind obviously at that point was pretty closed off to what was considered the best. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Uh, well, obviously, you obviously did qualify for actually London 2012. Uh, what an incredible achievement. Yeah, it, absolutely. that was one of so, my best games. Um, I can remember my mindset. Um, I've had some good games, but I wasn't expected to win. I was the new guy. I had yeah. zero expectations because I was just there, um, yeah, yeah. you know, and, and I shot really, really well, and I just soaked it all in. And, uh, yeah, it was definitely all the dreams that I had when I was little came true at that moment, even if they weren't exactly those dreams, right? Like I wanted to be Michael yeah. Jordan when I was younger. And the reason why you want to be Michael Jordan is because you just want to be the best at something that you love. And so I kind of yeah. felt like I had fulfilled my, my dreams, even if it was a different route at that moment. So I was just. I was soaking it all in. It was amazing. Yeah. So, Matt, so what question. sacrifices did you have to make to be in competitive form? For me, the sacrifices were more family-based. Um, okay. I went from, you know, 20, you know, not 20-some not years, but, you know, most of my adult life when I had kids with them all the time and seeing them yeah. every single okay. day to – overnight you know i'm half the month i'm gone and that was rough um 
I tried to do my best to kind of, you know, make sure, you know, obviously they still felt like they were loved and stuff like that. And I try to connect with them every single day when I was gone, but you could tell like they didn't like that very much. And so that was definitely the, the biggest sacrifice. And I had to tell myself like, this is why I'm traveling. This is why, you know, I want to be the best in the world at this. I love this sport, but I'm also doing it because this yeah. is how they're going to get shoes. And this is how I'm going to be able to buy groceries and pay for rent or electric bill. And, yeah. and I needed to remind them of that occasionally, even though that was really, really tough for me. Right. Where, so, Did you enjoy the spectacle of the Olympics? Hmm. I uh, feed off of energy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would like to say I'm a very, I like to be funny and energetic and I love, I love performing. I don't know. Maybe that's just in all athletes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Or, you know, you just like performing. And so for me, I loved it. Like I was in my element I love when I would hit a bullseye and people would go crazy and I'd hear them screaming and cheering. And I look over at my opponent who was shaking and nervous because they just realized I just shot a 10, you know, and, yeah, yeah. and right. I, you know, the, oh, I loved it so much. I, I didn't realize how much I loved it until Tokyo. Right. Okay. Um, Tokyo was, there was no fans at a big, huge stadium that would hold, you know, 10 or 15,000 people. And there was zero zero right. audience yeah. like it was like crickets it was so weird you know and, and i had to learn how to adapt as best i could um to that you know so okay. um, um what actually was it like actually being part of team team uh, usa <laughs> when i started archery my goal was to provide for my family yeah when I became part of Team USA, I realized what I was doing was much bigger than just trying to put food on the table for my family. Yeah, right. This literally was the first time in my life that I can remember that I was a part of something as a team that was bigger than me. And I, I loved it. Like, when I was younger, I always wanted to play sports. Yeah, I never made no teams. I, yeah. I just couldn't. Like I wanted to so bad to play, to play basketball or football or soccer. Just be a part of all the other kids running around and enjoying the sports, and I couldn't do that. Yeah, you know. Right. And and it wasn't like I tried because my dad let me try. I just you got to be honest with yourself sometimes, right? Yeah. And yep. so when I became part of Team USA, like. It's like see, it's like seeing somebody you love and you don't get to have that for like fifteen years, and then you finally get it. Like you just never let go. You fight for that every single day. You fight, you fight to be part of Team USA for as many years as you can because it's such an incredible feeling. Yeah, that's awesome. That's, awesome. that's very awesome. It's very inspiring. So, very were there any countries or athletes that you had a particular desire to do super well against? <laughs> all of them <laughs> right down so I'll be, I'll be your coaches like, yeah, please you said that yeah i'll be your mm-hmm. coaches love that response <laughs> um there was a guy the guy who beat me um in tokyo or in um london in london he was from finland yeah okay and uh he beat me in the gold medal match and i remember telling him in 2012 i said congratulations you're never going to beat me again yeah <laughs> and uh he he didn't understand what i was saying so he just agreed he's like yeah i know but <laughs> it's funny because i have yet to lose to him since then right and every time i go, go and i've shot against him probably four or five times a year yeah, yeah. since 2012 like every single year every single international event i go to he's at yeah and then I've beaten him. And so he's kind of like the main one. But now China has taken over. Right. Okay. China's got some good archers. Um, and in fact, at the games, they didn't beat my world record, but they set a new uh, Olympic record. And right. so obviously that's who I got to go after now. Uh, absolutely. You're on the hunt now. That's great. Okay. So you did superbly well through basically the heats that basically got you into the actual gold medal match that we've just been talking about. Can you actually talk us through those heats? Yeah. Um, I realized that it was a mind game when it comes to that because no tournament in the world is like that. 
So every four yeah. years we shoot that type of way and it's almost impossible to practice it. So what I would do is not saying I would purposely throw an arrow to be down, but if you look at all my matches, yeah. I was always losing and came back to win because I learned that yeah. people can't close out if they're right. winning. If, if uh, you're ahead, people immediately in their brain go, uh, if I, if I miss this shot, I'm going to lose. I, you know, but if you're chasing, you're like, watch this. I'm going to hit this 10. I'm going to hit this 10. And yeah, it yeah. changes your mindset a little bit. And I always yeah, shot yeah, better from you, behind. And so that's how I, that's how I went into it. And, uh, it worked pretty well until I got to the gold medal match. <laughs> well, well, um, you know, like you actually did amazingly well and you actually kind of walked away from that game with a single, with a, with a silver medal. Mm-hmm. I mean, wow. I mean, that is one hell of an accolade. Um, um, that actually must've made you left feeling fantastic. You know, um, it was more than I expected, to be honest. And yeah. it was, I know this sounds like you talk to other athletes who have medals and you ask them what they do with their medals. Yeah. And a lot of people say, I put them in a safe or they're in a safe place. Uh, mm-hmm. Mine spent the first two or three years in my glove box on my truck. I never took it out because everybody wanted to see right. it. And I wanted everybody to see it because there was a lot of people at home that helped me get there. And there was a lot of the town support was there to help me get to where I needed to be. And so I wanted to share that with everybody. Plus it gets you out of speeding tickets. If you have to open the glove box. (laughs) 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 Now I, now I have it just hanging on my safe and stuff like that, you know, and I, cause I still, the boys take it to show and tell and stuff. And for me, yes, it was amazing winning a medal. Um, but at the end of the day, it was the feelings I had when I won more so that was important to me than the actual medal itself. I, I, exactly. It it looks to be very, very inspiring when you stand up on the Olympic podium and you're receiving a medal. Can you tell me about that feeling and the inspiration that it, it provides from there? You know, I, I have learned something and what I've learned is that yes, in London, uh, I got a silver and I was able to stand on the podium and, and watch the American flag rise and, and all that kind of stuff. But what I've yeah. learned is, is in Rio, I had an equipment malfunction, uh, which caused, caused me to lose. And then in, in Tokyo, I also had some issues and I didn't do as well either but the outcome was still the same. The outpour, the, 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 the amount of people that came out and, and still showed their support, the people who still supported me, the people who came up to me and they didn't care if I won or not. They wanted to see how an armless man shoots a bow because it inspired them to be a better person. That yeah. to me was mm-hmm. better than anything. In fact, it's even, I've noticed that in Tokyo, even with my ninth place finish, um, there was more people that didn't care what, how my result was. And I had more people coming up to me and talking to me about how I motivated them to, to do something with their lives. And wow. that was the best feeling, to be honest. Like, uh, of course, that's incredible value. Medal. Of course you yeah. want to win a medal, but yeah, sure. Like, but at the end of the day, like you're helping people and it, and it doesn't to them is it's a medal too. Yes. It's great to see. The guy who won gold, no one knows about yet. I mean, I don't know if you guys just yeah. know his name, but everybody remembers I'm at Stutzman and everybody remembers that I took the time out to say hi to everybody. And everybody remembers yeah. that I was inspiring in the world. And I feel like that's, that's something that I remember every single day and I'll never forget yeah. it. And it keeps me humble and it keeps me pushing doing what I'm doing nowadays. Wow. Wow. That's they, fantastic. They truly are some some truly kind of unique memories then you've actually taken from sort of that event. Yeah. Uh, so Matt, did your silver medal change the expectations uh, from coaches and peers upon you from a competitive nature? You know, I try not to let it get to me. And of course it put a little bit of pressure on me because you're like, Hey, you already won once, you know, you should be able to win again. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, and so I added that pressure, but as far as from coaching and performance aspect of other things, it, uh, no, not, not so much. Um, it, like I said earlier, it's okay. just kind of, you know, it, it's an accomplishment, it's a medal. Um, but 
Someone said, you're only as good as your last tournament, supposedly. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so um, what happened after the Olympics from like sort of an actual sort of competitive front? Did you take part in any national competitions after that? Yep. I've uh, been part of Team USA from 2012 all the way up yep. until uh, this year. Um, I've been, uh, traveling, like I said, I, I shoot, I don't know, maybe nine major tournaments a year. Uh, that includes right. Czech Republic, okay. um, uh, Mexico, yeah. like uh, in February I go to Dubai, you know, like I'm still actively traveling all over the world. Um, I'm still the top guy in the U S uh, nice. which is still nice. Good. And, and my plan is to ride this wave. Um, and keep putting in the time until obviously my performances aren't as good. Like I know I didn't shoot so good in Tokyo, but sure. right before I went, I set a new world record by like 20 some points. So I still know I'm capable wow. of winning, you know? Um, yeah. and so don't tell nobody, but, uh, my plan is to at least try to make it to <laughs> LA 2028 and hopefully that will be my last nice. games. Nice. Awesome. I love nice. it. I'll come out and see you H- for hometown, sure. Baby, hometown, baby. <laughs> so, hometown. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Well, well, yeah. I mean, you know, if, if you're going to bow out anywhere, it's going to have to be in your hometown, isn't it? No, that would be incredible. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, so the next time you hit the news was like 2015, like you mentioned, for making it into the Guinness Book of World Records. Mm-hmm. Can you tell me about that? And how, how does it feel to be a world record holder? Well, uh... It was one of those things where I, maybe it's my desire to be the best, but I see a guy get a bow and he shoots like 200 yards and hits a balloon. And I'm like, and he was bragging about he was the best archer in the world who could shoot the furthest and most accurate. So of course I'm like, uh, I got, and this was an able body guy with no disability. So (laughs) I'm like, you know what? Right. I I got to put that to rest, right? If you want to be the best in the world, you got to you got to go after all challenges. It doesn't matter what it is. Oh, you totally, to go, yeah, totally. You got you to go for it. And so uh, I went down to <laughs> Texas. Uh, where uh, are you guys familiar with or heard of Michael um, Johnson, the Olympic runner? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Uh, I went down to his place, and that's where I did that at. Um, right. And and once again, once I got it, it had nothing to do. <laughs> with the pamphlet or the, the the award that said I was a Guinness World Record holder, but it was just reinforcing in my brain that I can compete with these guys. Yeah. Absolutely. That's incredible. Mm-hmm. That's incredible. So um what can you tell us about your journey in Rio in two thousand and sixteen? That was a tough one. Uh Rio wasn't my best, but I was shooting really well. I came out with a release that was brand new and I shot it amazing. And I, I knew I was like, I felt like I was good enough to win. And in one of my elimination matches, the very last arrow, I needed a 10 to win. And when I shot, it was an eight and I couldn't figure out why, because it was a good shot. And what happened was, is there's this little plastic piece. It's a knock. And it attaches the arrow okay. to the bowstring, and that actually had broke uh, when I when I fired the bow. It was uh, honestly, it was a one in a million, kind of like me when I was born. Yeah. You know, uh, it's a rarity, right. oddity that it happened, and and it happened, and it caused the arrow to go off track. Uh, and so I didn't do very well. What that did, however, do was motivate me. Because the very next year, I switched to able-bodied only competitions and won the U.S. national target. And that was out of wow. all the best archers in that United States has able-bodied. And we're talking like the top five best ranked world archers in the world. Um, so um, what actually can you tell us about your journey in Rio in actually 2016? Rio was uh, a different games for me. It was uh, a different experience in London. Yeah, I remember shooting really good. I felt really good. Uh, in fact, uh, I felt like I could win it the way I was shooting. Yeah. And in one of my elimination matches, I had a knock break, right. which is a little plastic piece that attaches to the arrow to the bow. And my bow shoots these arrows at about 200 miles per hour. So within about... Wow. 
two feet in front of my bow, that arrow's already doing 200 miles an hour. So it's wow. a lot of kinetic yeah, energy. Yeah. And it broke. It was like one in a million. It's a really rare thing that happened and made the arrow go off off course and, and hit an eight. And so therefore I didn't win. It was, t- it was tough for me because initially I had spent, you know, I had spent four years training for that exact moment yeah. and then it was over and wow. I hadn't won, you know, but I used it as motivation to come back even stronger the next year. Excellent. That's incredible. Well, your first, <laughs> your first foray into film and TV work was, you know, you being in uh, knockout in 2016. How'd that come about? And <laughs> no, that show. Uh, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, uh, that was an opportunity that I had. Um, that was actually, it was good. Um, there was some, it pushed me as an archer mm-hmm. for sure. Um, there was some challenges that I didn't know how I was going to do. Yeah. Um, some things that weren't in my wheelhouse that I hadn't practiced. And so it was a good challenge to see. And I, I made it what, halfway through the season, I think. Um, which was still amazing. I, if I were to redo it all over again, I would be more prepared. Yeah. Uh, but like I said, at that time I was kind of new to it and I just, like I said, you gotta be the best. You have to go and try all sorts of different things. So I I went for it. Um, um, it. you actually said about like kind of doing it again. So like sort of, I'm taking that, um, 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 you actually enjoyed the experience then. I did enjoy the experience. Yes. I, um, it wasn't my most fond memories of being an archer. And that's just cause I didn't do as well. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and it was on national television. So everybody sees it. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, but I would do, I would do it again in a heartbeat. That's fabulous. Well, you went on to feature in the 2016 advertisement. We're the superhumans. Did you enjoy that experience? Uh, you know, that's, let me, let me uh, go back a little bit. Um, okay. When I did knockout, that was kind of, my introduction to commercials and TV and stuff. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's, I fell in love with that side of things because I saw that as a way to introduce people to the world of Matt Stutzman and what I was ultimately trying to get across. And so after knockout, when people come to me about commercials or, you know, any type of promotional stuff, I was all about it. And I, I put a lot of energy and effort into it because I realized how important it was. Yeah. Excellent. Awesome. So, um, obviously, um, it was seen, sorry, the, um, 2016 advert with the superhumans was seen as being a very important feature in actually raising the profile for actually kind of for, for like sort of Paralympic athletes. Did you actually feel that are actually the time? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the difference between, after that um, type of awareness was starting to be raised, you could see just the people's mindsets that you ran into change. Yeah. Uh, right. Before they would look at you as somebody with a physical disability. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, or I walk walk into Walmart, and then there would be a kid that'd be like, "Hey, mom, that guy has no arms," and the mom would be like, "Shush, don't look at him." Like I had something or something, you know. But now, <laughs> since that type of stuff, since that type of stuff is starting to be out there where people are getting more aware that it's okay. Like, yeah. We're okay. You know, we might be bo- look differently, but we're still okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. Exactly. Now what you're seeing is, is the kid go, Hey mom, that, that guy has no arms. And you're going to see the mom go, well, yeah, but you can go talk to him if you want to. He's it's cool. Like it's fine. Yeah. And I'd be like, I lost my arms because I picked my boogers and my mom told me not. To. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe you shouldn't do that. <laughs> Well, what can you tell us about the Netflix documentary Rising Phoenix and how did that come about? Uh, That (laughs) was amazing. I got a call from a producer and they were talking to me about what their idea was. And I couldn't wait to be a part of that because it was the first time uh, in a different, completely different way that they were going to be able to tell my story and bring awareness to what I believed in. Yeah. And what we were trying to get across, like it was the first kind of real documentary slash, you know, movie that was producer made that talked about all the stuff with physical disabilities and what we really are capable of. I thought that was a huge milestone in somebody not only believing in what we believed in, but was able to put a little bit of money behind it to back it, to help bring more awareness to the rest of the world. Right. 
So that's awesome. That so that clearly had, had actually sort of quite a big impact upon your life. Yeah, that um, it kind of changed my life even better. I don't know how right. to even say that, but it, it made yeah. my life even better because people. It's amazing. People uh, like I nicknamed myself the armless archer a long right. time ago. Right. Yeah. But now people are just like, there's that awesome archer who can do anything he wants. Yeah. You know, like it's like, it's, they don't even like call. I mean, some people still do, but it's, it's different now. Like, you know, like people are running up to me and they want to take a picture with me, not yeah. an art, like not, not the armless archer. They want to take a picture with me because they see me as um, somebody that they can look up to, you know, yeah, and that's incredible. That, that is incredible feeling yeah. like it. I'm not, not going to lie. It took me a while to adjust to yeah. all this. Like you, sure. it's, it's a lot, but it's amazing all at the same time. Hmm. That's, that's what I got from the interview that I saw you on as yeah, well. And much. that's why, why we chased you. And, you know, I want you here on my right stuff because of the inspiration that you provide. And man, I, I just like, I've been having chills in this whole mm-hmm. time. Anyway, you know, I'll stop. I'll stop being a fanboy for a second. <laughs> it's, it's all right. I I like to say this a lot, um, and I because I feel like it's important. But if you were to come into my house right now, besides a picture on the wall, you would not know that a guy without arms lives here. Mm-hmm. Okay. I have no modifications in my house. I run a normal stove. I have a normal fridge. I have normal door handles. Like there is nothing in my house that is modified. Like wow, I drive great. a car, I race cars and it's not modified. Like I, I don't have a special license. Like I have a normal license that allows me to drive anything I want. Yeah. Like I didn't need millions of dollars to live. Like I figured right. it out and, yeah. and, that's what I want people to know is out of anybody in the world, I had the perfect opportunity to just do nothing and, yeah. and lay around and be sad for myself. And I'm not that way. Like mm. I want people to understand that if I can do what I'm doing and living, then what's their excuse? What's the issue that they're going through that they can't overcome? Yeah, right. totally. Exactly. Well, that's incredible. That really so competitively, incredible. To Rio, you dusted yourself off and you continue to compete and qualify again for Tokyo in 2020. Well, 2021. Um, <laughs> how did the games being delayed a year affect you? Or did it? Yeah, you know, it I always say it, it helped me mentally. Um, I was I was ready for the games, um, but I what I it was a much needed kind of like reset because I had trained to kind of peak at a certain time Mm -hmm. and mentally even and and then that happened and it went away so i had to mentally take a reset but here's why it was amazing i spent the last 10 years traveling half the month i was gone from my family yeah and then all of 2000 basically 19 when COVID happened and and through like 20 i got to spend over a year at home with my family Mm -hmm. i didn't miss any birthdays i didn't miss any special events I got to do stuff with my family. Like that was amazing. Cause I hadn't had that in 10 years. Yeah. Right. You know, and, and, and I loved it. It was, uh, I feel like it, it may, it set me up to have a, a good games, which ninth is not the best games, but I was still okay with it. Yeah. Um, did actually the closed nature of actually Tokyo 2021 make you feel a little bit detached from it at all? Yeah, um, it was definitely, uh, like I said, I would go again. Um, yeah. The experience was good, but there, it didn't feel really? like, I'm not I'm not going to lie about it. It didn't feel like in games yeah. super much. You know, I, I didn't, we didn't get to go to opening and closing ceremonies. Right. Um, you know, they ship you out as soon as you're done. Like the day after I lost, the next day I was on a plane home already. They wow. just, you know, like... Th- you didn't get to hang out with friends that you've known for 10 years that you see at all these events. You got a safe distance and social distance. There was no fans. And I wasn't allowed to bring any family. And in the right. other games prior, I yeah. always had family there. Right. Oh, that must so difficult. okay. It was, uh, yeah. you know, it, not that that didn't like, 
I wouldn't say that that didn't affect my performance. That's not why yeah. I didn't do as well, but it definitely was a, like, it definitely was weird and tough, like in aspects of just trying to like stay focused about what yeah. we were doing. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, there was nobody in the crowd even cheering. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, there was no crowd to cheer. There was no crowd there yeah. to cheer, was there? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's like um, going to it's like going to a Super Bowl, and uh, right. there's no one there. It almost makes you feel like, what did I do wrong? <laughs> I, nobody wants to watch right, me. Right, right. <laughs> uh, so with um, so I guess you know the only camaraderie you really had was your colleagues um, on, on on Team USA, right? So you know you had to. Did you guys do anything special to to get the you know? keep the attitude up of we're going to win this thing and, you know, and, and keep the camaraderie of the games going or the spirit, I should say. Well, I mean, we, we tried our best, but mm-hmm. not, no, I mean, we did have a recurve that won gold, which is uh, amazing. Um, that yeah, and this right? was his first games, you know, so that was amazing. It was, it was tough because we had a social distance, so yeah. we weren't really necessarily allowed to like hang out in groups and yeah. do stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, so it, it, it was, I mean, we would try our best through messages. Like yeah. <laughs> right. we didn't get, we didn't get together and <laughs> hang out and, and play, you know, uh, we call it cornhole, but it's uh bags or, you know, we didn't play any games. We didn't hang yeah. out. Like it was, yeah. you know, um, but we, right. you know, we, we tried Sad. to do our best. Right. Well, here on My Right Stuff, we have this little uh, little game we like to play, kind of. And uh, it's called Show Us Your Hidden Talents. So, mm. I'm going to ask you, sir, um, do you have any hidden talents that you'd like to share with us here on My Right Stuff? <laughs> I can whistle, like, four different ways. Like, okay, so I can I can blow out. <whistles> then I can suck it in. And then I can go between my tongue, and then I can use my fingers. See? <laughs> I, th- I think that's got to be our best hidden talent yet. I think. <laughs> I think so too. <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> that's great thank you i, I love that one <laughs> so what's next for for matt stutzman uh so believe it or not um i, I race cars so right now um i'm building and racing cars in fact uh, last sunday i decided to to switch to a different division which was called the outlaw class which is basically high horsepower yeah. Uh, the top guys in, that are around Iowa and I ended up third on my first race of the are racing in that division. So I'm doing that. But yeah. when it Congrats. comes to archery, of course, I'm still training. They just mm-hmm. introduced that Vegas. The Vegas tournament is going to be back full go this year, which is nice. uh, payouts like a hundred grand to win. Wow. And okay. in the past, I've been only one point off from winning. Wow. And that was the, that's basically... Um, the only tournament I have never finished or podiumed at out of every single tournament I've been to. Right. So that's kind of oh, wow. like the rare one that escapes me. So it's I'm still expected. shooting. I'm still going after it. My goal yeah. is to win Vegas, uh, yeah. go to Paris and LA. Yeah. Nice. That's fabulous. I love it. Well, Matt, you know, this has been an incredible conversation. I've really, really enjoyed being able to sort of get to know you. But where can people find out a bit more about you? The best place to follow me is on Facebook. I've heard that Facebook isn't a thing much anymore, but uh, the Armless Archer yeah. on Facebook. I do have an Instagram, but it was yeah, it was hacked. Uh, so I don't do much on Instagram oh, nice. or Twitter anymore. Um, yeah. So uh-huh. the Armless Archer on Facebook. Okay, super. That's Thank awesome. you very much. Well, Matt, this has been a very informative and inspirational episode. I really, I I can't thank you enough. And I love learning all about you, your family, your struggles to become who you are today. And that to me is very inspirational. And thank you. Thank you very much again for being the inspiration that you are and taking the time to be on this episode of My Right Stuff. 
I enjoyed it a lot, and thank you so much for having me. If you ever want me back on, just let me know. Oh, you're more than welcome. Absolutely. We thank love to do much. updates. We love to do, you know, uh, any news about you. Um, you know, and I also want to thank my distinguished co-host, Mr. Gareth Dighton, and our whole My Ride Stuff crew for making this podcast possible every week. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. No star, and take care, my lovelies, and we'll catch up with you soon. And thank you, Matt, and we'll talk soon. Thank you, Matt. Do you suffer from insomnia, depression, or anxiety? Well, my sponsor, Tomes, may be able to help you in these areas. Tomes, a natural sleep and sound healing portal, helping people globally to get to sleep faster and stay asleep longer. And you can find this piece of gold at tomes.com. That's www.taumhoms.com. Well, Toby, most of all, I'd like to say a big thank you to all who stream, download, watch and support My Right Stuff. And please, my friends, keep spreading the word. We really appreciate it. Also, we now have a, a merch store that you can go and collect some snazzy merch for those lovely bodies. Go to MyRightStuff.com and click on the store tab. And if you do that, don't forget to tag us in any photos of our merch so we can give you a live shout out in an episode. So... Remember to subscribe on YouTube so you never miss an episode. And I hear it will also give you 10 years. Good luck. Ring that bell, my friends. Well, this has been another exciting episode of My Right Stuff. Be sure to tune in next week and every week for yet another adventurous and informative show. I'm your host, Lord Toby Wright. And remember to listen loud, play hard, and keep reaching for your dreams. Good night. Stuff. This episode was brought to you by Tomes, a natural sleep and sound healing portal available globally at www.tomes.com. That's www.taumhoms.com.